Thank you very much, Andy, and thank you to all those who have helped in organizing this conference. What a terrific job in, in assembling this conference. I, I, I'm, I'm very appreciative of the chance to be here. Well, debates about federalism, much like the American federalist system itself, are constantly evolving. Each generation brings forth new critiques, new questions about the American federal system and whether it's contributing to effective governance. And it's important for us to consider these critiques of American federalism, as I propose to do today. And it's important for several reasons. Perhaps most important, I'll put this out front and center, because if we ever concluded that the American federal system was no longer contributing to effective governance, we have it within our power to shape or change that. After all, in the founding era, we consciously chose and deliberately chose to create a robust federal system, a federal government of enumerated powers and state governments retaining a good deal of autonomy. We chose that system, but we could as have easily chosen a different system. We could have chosen a unitary system where the central government would have plenary powers. It might parcel out responsibilities to states or departments, however they might have been called, as they saw fit. As I say, we could have chosen such a system. And if we ever conclude through deliberation that the federal system is no longer contributing to effective governance, we could shape, change it, and move it more in that direction through judicial interpretation, through constitutional amendment, in short, my point is, is that this discussion about the value of federalism is of more than just theoretical interest. It's also of practical interest and practical consequences could follow from it. So what are these critiques that have been voiced throughout American history about why the federal system might not be seen as functioning effectively? And how have those critiques changed through the years? one of my purposes today. But even more important, to what extent are these critiques of American federalism persuasive in arguing that federalism does not contribute to effective governance? To what extent should we be persuaded by those critiques? Or to what extent, on the other hand, might we conclude that these critiques fall short and that federalism still contributes to effective governance? I will argue today for the latter of those positions. And I'll do so by considering what I take to be the four leading critiques of federalism. I will argue that two longstanding critiques, that federalism is associated with depriva deprivation of minority rights, and that federalism leads to an unhealthy race to the bottom. I'll argue that these two critiques have less persuasiveness and less force now than they did as recently as several decades ago. I'll then consider a third critique, which far from decreasing in importance, has probably increased in importance. This critique is the critique is we no longer have the support structure to maintain a robust federal system because state political communities are no longer as meaningful as they once were. As I say, it's a serious critique. I argue in the end that it's unpersuasive in an increasingly polarized era especially. I'll devote most of my time today to a fourth critique that I view as the most potent of the critiques. The critique in, in snapshot version here goes something like this. In an age of increasing policy complexity and policy responsibilities, policy making is impoverished by having a federal government have to bargain with autonomous states in order to get policy made. It leads to inefficiency. It leads to obstruction. I will argue that this, in the end, is also unpersuasive, just as the other arguments. And in fact, argue to the contrary, that this turns out to be a major advantage of the federal system, that it allows for and requires bargaining among federal and state governments. So this might end up turn out to be an advantage of federalism. One final comment by way of preview, and then I'll actually delve into my remarks. I might argue then that this advantage that I'm claiming, far from a critique, it turns out to be an advantage, might actually be added to our standard list of advantages of the federal system. I take the standard list 
that come from Justice O'Connor's opinion in a 1991 Supreme Court decision, Gregg versus Ashcroft. This is the canonical list of the benefits of the federal system. And I, I want to quote it here because I, I want to set this out. I, I believe that, that this is useful. So if I could just quote this. Justice O'Connor wrote, and this was a quarter century ago, this federalist structure of joint sovereigns preserves to the people numerous advantages. It assures a decentralized government that will be more sensitive to diverse needs of a heterogeneous society. It increases opportunity for citizen involvement in democratic processes. It allows for more innovation and experimentation in government. And it makes government more responsive by putting the states in competition for a mobile citizenry. Perhaps the principal benefit of the federal system is a check on abuses of government power. That's a quote from Justice O'Connor a quarter century ago. I'd argue today that each of those advantages remains compelling and that we might even add to that list. So with that being said, by way of my purpose today, let me jump in. Let me start, as I say, I want to take up four critiques and I want to analyze each of them. Let me start with the first critique. The first critique was for many years the most powerful, and rightly so. The first critique of federalism rested on the view that state autonomy was inextricably bound up with maintenance of slavery and racial segregation. And that this was seen as a central piece of evidence in, against the federal system. That it was seen as associated with deprivation rather than protection of minority rights. As I say, a very powerful argument. But this critique, while we can't completely put it to the side, has less force today than it did certainly a half century ago. It's not only that the federal government, through a series of congressional acts and Supreme Court decisions, has assumed responsibility for protecting civil and voting rights to a great extent. But it's also the case that additional evidence has come to the fore about the way in which the federal system contributes to the protection of minority rights as well. Now, we've always had evidence of this kind. Probably the leading evidence is women secured the right to vote quicker on a broader basis in the American system than they would have if the US had a unitary system rather than the federal system that it had. But in recent decades, additional evidence has come to the fore, as I say, and probably the leading piece of evidence, same-sex couples secured the right for legal recognition of civil unions and marriage earlier and, again, on a broader basis because the US had a federal system than they would if we'd had a unitary system. Now, this is a key reason, I would say, not the only reason, but a key reason, why liberals have softened their opposition to federalism in recent years. To some extent, this can be seen as an ideological dimension of federalism. And yet, not only have a number of liberals softened their opposition, but have actually come to embrace federalism in recent years because it has been shown that in important cases, federalism has actually been associated with the protection rather than deprivation of minority rights. At the least, I think it's safe to conclude that the association of federalism with deprivation of minority rights is voiced much less prominently and confidently today than in earlier years. Well, a second critique. This, this has never been quite as prominent as the minority rights critique. But if you, particularly in po policy making circles, it's always had a lot of purchase, although I would argue less so today. If we take ourselves back to the 1970s and 1980s, one of the central critiques of federalism was is that it will lead to an unhealthy race to the bottom in policy making. That is, the argument that was voiced is states are seen as having an interest in competing with another, and once they compete with each other, their interest is in reducing welfare benefits and commitments, weakening environmental standards. And this is seen as, a, again, a general mark against federalism because it encourages, certainly it allows this race to the bottom. Well, such is the critique. Uh, but recent events, have, particularly since the 1990s, have 
presented some real challenges for this race to the bottom critique. For one thing, supporters of this critique have had to run up and confront the, confront the evidence of what's happened since the 1996 federal welfare reform law, which devolved a significant amount of responsibility for welfare policy to the states. So we're now 20 years, just about 20 years out from this law. What's happened? What's not clearly happened is, is there's not clear evidence that states with this extra responsibility have lowered welfare benefit rates, the duration of welfare benefit amounts. That's not what we've seen. Recent events regarding environmental policy and climate change have also raised challenges for this race to the bottom critique. In fact, in the last decade, a number of state governments have taken the lead in passing climate. Often well in advance of Now, I, I don't want to be peremptory here, and I've always, obviously been very brief. I don't want to be peremptory in saying the debate is clearly settled. It's, 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 it's clearly settled on this side and not the other side. I don't have time to, to go into that, and I don't want to be unfair and, and, and unfairly summarize things. But I do think it's fair to say, safe to say that the race to the bottom theory is not held up well in light of welfare reform uh, experience of the last 20 years and a number of key areas in climate change in a way that, again, raises doubts about the persuasiveness of this race to the bottom critique of American federalism. Well, it, it, I would say that it's not that states don't compete with one another. It's just that they're likely to compete to be providing the best air and water quality protection as they are to compete on other grounds. Well, so much for the second critique. If these two first critiques, I, I'd argue that they're less prominent and less voiced confidently, less today than in previous years. The third critique that I want to make is history. This third critique has taken on renewed interest in recent years. This third critique is a little bit different, though. This third critique doesn't necessarily say that federalism is harmful. It says merely federalism is less relevant or less necessary today. And the claim is as follows. Well, federalism might once have been important when state political communities were meaningful and important. But state political communities aren't as meaningful or necessary today. Certainly not in a case where individuals are often very mobile moving from state to state, or in a situation where we increasingly consume news from national media outlets, or in a situation where people increasingly conceive of themselves, I'm a member of a national community. So the critique is, to summarize, is state political communities less meaningful, people identify less with their states than with the national community, so therefore less relevant and necessary today. As I say, this critique isn't so much that federalism is harmful. It's just we don't need it as much. It's not as necessary. Well, it's an important claim, um, and it has been subjected to a lot of scrutiny, naturally. I will say on this particular point that the conference in a later panel tomorrow will feature the person who has subjected this to the most scrutiny of anybody I know, Professor Ernest Young, who has a comprehensive analysis of state political identity. And so I, I don't want to uh, say m too much more here, but you, you'll get a comprehensive analysis here. But let me say a few things, nevertheless, about this question and about this critique. What I would say is that this claim may or not, may not be correct about the extent to which individuals still identify with state political communities. If we speak about identity, to say, well, are you an American or are you, are you a North Carolinian? That'd be one question. I, I, don't, I, I don't have a firm answer on this. But how about if we ask a different and I would say more important question? To what extent are political attitudes, views, and policies in state communities more relevant today or not relevant? And I would argue that the differences between state political communities today are as broad as ever and are in fact, it might almost be seen as perverse to make this critique today of American federalism in a polarized era 
where we're so divided on so many questions that state political communities are less important. Let me set out some reasons why I think this might almost be perverse. First, let's look at election returns. Let me just focus on the presidential election returns. It's not just that there are a declining number of marginal states in the Electoral College, and an increasing number of states where the margin of victory for one party or another, 40 percentage points, 30 percentage points, 20 percentage points Republican or Democratic. It's not just that. That's a standard point. It's also the consistency of support for one party or another in the states. Let me explain. There was not a single county in Massachusetts or Vermont that voted for Mitt Romney in 2012. There was not a single county in Utah or Oklahoma in 2012 that voted for Barack Obama. It's not just the consistency of states. Within the states, we have meaningful political difference. How about if we move away from uh, kind of election returns as an indication of the vitality of state political communities? How about if we look at the important and widening differences in the policies adopted in the states? Let me take three issues. I don't think anybody would say these are minor issues today. Abortion, guns, and voter registration. We not only see wide differences among the 50 states, we see those differences expanding. Take abortion. A number of states in the last few years have moved to tighten access to abortion, and yet a few states have made a bid in the other direction to make it more, abortion more accessible. Same story can be told with guns. In regard to guns, a number of states have moved to loosen access to guns in recent years, and yet a handful of states have moved the other direction to tighten access. Consider voter registration. In the last few years, a number of states have moved to either eliminate same-day registration or cut down on early voting days, and yet California just joined Oregon in adopting automatic registration. Completely different direction. In short, far from becoming less important over time, I would argue differences between states' political communities, at least regarding political attitudes, are widening in recent years. Whether this is because people are increasingly self-sorting, consciously choosing to live with other like-minded persons, or for other reasons, whatever the case, state political communities are, have stark differences and widening differences. And in fact, I would argue to turn things around on the critique, this might actually be seen as a virtue of American federalism. In an increasingly polarized era, where divisions on policies are stark and widening, and when these differences often line up along state lines, it's an important virtue of a federal system to allow these policy matters to be thought out and resolved in state political communities, rather than trying to craft a national policy where a consensus is going to be much more difficult to achieve and where efforts to reach a consensus might actually further inflame polarization. So much for my the third critique then. Let me turn finally and spend the remainder of my time dealing with a fourth critique that I view as the most powerful in the contemporary era. The claim that policymaking can't tolerate the inefficiency and obstruction endemic in a federal system. This complaint is an oft heard one. It takes various forms. But the common theme is as follows. In an era of policy complexity, interdependence, global competition, we are impoverished, not helped, by inheriting an 18th century federal system where the federal government oftentimes cannot mandate that something must be done, but must rather bargain with state officials in order to secure their participation. How much better, the argument goes, how much better would we be in making education policy and health policy if the federal government could just mandate that something be done and didn't have to work through a federal system for making or administering policy? Such, as I say, is the argument. And I view this as the most serious of the current critiques, but also I find an ultimately unpersuasive critique. In fact, as I've done throughout here, to the contrary, 
the federal system might actually be seen as making policy making in an approved fashion rather than an impoverished fashion, the exact opposite of what the critique claims. I say this for the following reasons, and then I'll present some illustrations, but to set out my reasons. Federal government decision makers left to their own devices will oftentimes craft impractical policy. Sometimes because they set hopelessly unrealistic expectations or goals. Sometimes because they're acting in haste or in crisis and without due deliberation. And sometimes the problem is that federal officials don't have an appreciation for what it takes to actually administer a policy or don't appreciate of administering it. So let me give three illustrative cases to show, to illustrate my points here. Let me start with education. Let me take the No Child Left Behind Act. What's striking is the hopelessly unrealistic goals set by congressional drafters in 2001. Congress really did believe that it was possible for 100% of students to be proficient by the year 2014. And they built the entire law around that goal. Testing in grades three through eight. Requirement that states show and districts show adequate yearly progress towards full proficiency for states and districts that didn't show adequate yearly progress. In short, in a tip fashion, all too typical of federal decision making, hopelessly unrealistic goals were the bedrock. How fortunate then that state officials were able to push back against the law because they saw the goal. They saw alternative means of achieving these goals. And Congress couldn't really mandate that much of the No Child Left Act could be done. Congress simply did not have that mandate. What Congress could do, it could threaten to withhold grants from non-complying states. Utah was one of the first states to pass a law requiring that insofar as state goals conflicted with federal should be seen. Uh, Connecticut filed suit against the US Education Department. Some districts, as in Colorado, opted out of the No Child Left Behind Act and said, we'll take the financial consequences. By the time we got to 2010, 2011, a number of states were threatening to opt out of the law altogether and just so take the consequences. These state actions signaled to federal officials the unrealistic expectations of the law's drafters and over time led the law's implementers to modify the law in healthy directions granting waivers, interpreting the statute differently. The Bush administration was one that had to make the first changes. Um, they made some changes in how adequate yearly progress was calculated. It seems curious today, but the original law said, here's how we'll calculate adequate yearly progress. Um, we'll compare this year's third grade to next year's third grade to the following year's third grade. A number of states said, how much better it would be if we compared this year's third grade to next year's fourth grade to the next year's fifth grade so we see actually how the same students grow over time. That wasn't the original law. But states, by pushing back, by seeing an alternative solution, were able to re reach waivers and result in better policy making. And then the Obama administration, under renewed pressure from states, ended up granting comprehensive waivers to the vast majority of states, freeing states from the law's onerous requirements, albeit under the condition that they follow alternative goals for taking steps to achieve the law's policies. Now, the full story of No Child Left Behind Act is obviously much longer than what I've told here. My main point is, imagine if we did not have a federal system. Perhaps if we only had a decentralized system where states possessed powers by the grace of Congress, how much worse would education policy have been in the aftermath of No Child Left Behind in a situation where, where state officials lack the autonomy, the will, to push back against unrealistic aspects of the law. How, un, how fortunate then that state officials are able to provide what one scholar has recently termed, quote, a bureaucratic and political reality check. It's the best. 
Let me give a, a, a second of three illustrative cases before concluding. In the aftermath of the terror attacks of 9-11, Congress set out to make driver's licenses more secure. And then in 2005, a House committee chair inserted in a must-pass defense appropriations bill. This is one of those bills that always goes through. It was, going to fund, it was funding the Iraq war, after all. No chance that that was going to fail. And they inserted in that overall law the Real ID Act of 2005. And the Real ID Act directed states, you must do the following with your driver's licenses. Get this information, put the following on your driver's licenses, link up with this information. And by the way, do that in three years' time. Well, how fortunate, once again, my lesson, that the US has a federal system where state officials with experience and expertise in this area push back against unrealistic expectations in a way that's resulting in a more deliberative process. After all, once again, the federal government lacks the power to directly mandate that states do anything with a driver's license. All the federal government can do is say, states not complying will see their residents' driver's licenses not be accepted for boarding commercial airplanes or any federal building. Well, in this context, states, seeing this as a hopelessly unrealistic timeline and seeing other flaws in the law, Half of the states passed laws saying, we have no intention of changing our driver's licenses, and certainly not in the designated time. And we'll suffer the consequences. Well, after more than half of the states took this action, Department of Homeland Security started making concessions. The short version is a law that was supposed to take effect in 2008. The latest concession is driver's license should now be compliant by 2016 is the argument that's made. Once again, my, my reasonable persons can differ on the merits of the Real ID Act. My point is that policy making often suffers from insufficient deliberation under realistic expectations. Thankfully, the states in our system retain a good amount of autonomy to draw on their experience and expertise with governments and to push policy making to be more deliberative in health. Let me close with a final illustrative case and then make a few final remarks. Let me close with the case of health policy and focus on the Affordable Care Act, again, briefly um, in each case. Now, some observers have seen vindication of their critiques of federalism with the Affordable Care Act. I say, how much better health care policy making would have been with the Affordable Care Act if Congress could have simply mandated a national solution, didn't have to bargain with state officials? In this case, folks might say, you're going to use the Affordable Care Act as a support for policy making in a federal system? Uh, you're going to greet my claims with some puzzlement. It's exactly the opposite. Well, let me briefly explain. The Affordable Care Act has two key components. One, the setting up of insurance exchanges to deliver uh, uh, insurance to individuals and small business owners. And the second part is expansion of Medicaid to cover many more uh, persons than originally. The first part of that, the insurance exchange, the original law originally said binary choice. States, you either run the entirety of your exchanges or let the federal government do it. Well, Utah was one of the first states to push back. And Utah said, well, we actually already have a small business exchange, but the law doesn't allow us to run that and let you run the other one. Big bargaining with the federal government. Eventually, the federal government official said, OK, you, we'll, we'll let you keep running your exchange that's working well in this part, and we'll run the other part. Nowhere was that in the law itself that emerged out of a bargaining between state and federal officials. Other, uh, some 18 other states have actually bargained as well. Where they said, well, how about if we run these particular aspects of the exchanges and the federal government runs these exchanges? Nowhere in the law is there provision for a so-called partnership exchange, and yet that's what's emerged out of these negotiations. Briefly, also, on the Medicaid expansion provision, um, that, that's the second part. Here, again, the original plan was for all states to expand Medicaid coverage for a number of persons. Um, cover them under Medicaid rules, albeit with more generous reimbursement rates from the federal government. But after a 2012 U.S. Supreme Court decision ensured that state participation was really optional, not just technically optional, but really mandatory, states realized we're in a bargaining position. So a number of state officials said, you want us to expand Medicaid, but under existing Medicaid rules, we would be interested in possibly expanding Medicaid, but in ways that we think would actually contribute to better health thing outcomes and it will actually lead to better savings. Well, the federal government, through such bargaining, has given waivers to Arkansas, Indiana, Iowa, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and New Hampshire. 
fact, it's produced a variety of innovative pl of plans. For instance, in some states, they say, we will expand Medicaid, but under the condition that individual recipients participate in wellness programs. And if they don't, they have to pay more. It's nowhere in the law, nowhere in Medicaid policy. And yet states, by pushing back, have said, we can actually get better policy. The main point is, is that policymaking, far from being impoverished by a federal system, might actually be said to be improved. Well, in closing, I've, I've, I have not made an effort in these remarks to be comprehensive and a consideration of all of the advantages of the federal system. As I mentioned at the start, Justice O'Connor's eminently quotable paragraph in her Ashcroft decision a quarter century ago provides a good summary of the standard canonical virtues of federalism. Allows for more competition, allows for more Tocquevillian learning of the habits and traits of citizenship that govern, allows for laboratories of experimentation and innovation. All these standard arguments are important virtues of the federal system. I want to maintain them. But what I've tried to do today in my consideration of various critiques and responses is that we might actually add an additional advantage to that standard list about policymaking being more improved in a federal system where federal government officials can't mandate that much be done, but must bargain with state officials to secure their participation in a way that actually leads to better policymaking in the result. 